So hello everybody. Yes, you have come through to the Legally Yours and Silicon Beach Lunch and Learn session. And today we are with the incredible team um, with from Allied Legal, so Todd and Christine, who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, but before we get started in the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that I'm standing on here today, which is the Boon Boon Wurrung and the Wurundjeri Wurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin Nation. And I acknowledge that sovereignty of this, of this land has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land and I pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of today. Um, David, I'm going to hand over to you to do a little bit of acknowledgement on some of the community sponsors and to say hello to everybody. Thank you so much, Karen, and welcome, uh, Christine and Tal from Allied Legal. Um, and everyone else on the call, uh, thank you for joining us today for an exciting topic about uh, um, IP, intellectual property, uh, why it is so important for you as a startup founder. Um, we have a lunch, lunch and learn session here today, so it will be very informative. You will get a lot of knowledge out of it. And um, yeah, we will have some more upcoming, uh, like next week with our latest community sponsor, um, Silver Pen Studios, which will talk about storytelling for startups, leverage the power of your story to build your brand. And um, if anyone is interested to become a sponsor, run a lunch and learn session with us, please reach out to me at any time. I will pop my email address into the chat and um, yeah, let's have a conversation. Thank you so much. And back to you, Karen and Christine and Tal. Ah, thanks so much, David. Um, and yes, please, if you're in the chat, well, um, say hello. Let us know where you're coming in from as well. It's always good to get a conversation going. So before I introduce and set up um, our lunch and learn, just a little bit on me of people who don't know me. So obviously, my name is Karen Finch, and I'm a non-practicing lawyer. I'm the CEO of Legally Yours. I'm a board member of the Australian Legal Technology Association and a committee chair of the Women of Australian Legal Tech. I'm a legal tech editor for Idea Spies, a passionate ambassador of the progressive law movement, and obviously with what I'm doing here as well, a very, very strong supporter of the Australian startup community and a little bit on Legally Yours if you don't know what we do. So we are Australia's leading legal marketplace that enables everyday Australians to access quality experienced lawyers and all without the bill shock just like Tolt and Christine. So we take the confusion and difficulty in trying to find the right lawyer by matching you with vetted experienced lawyers who only offer upfront fixed pricing on their legal services. So think a lawyer, no bill shock, they're going to tell you what it's going to cost and you've got all that lovely guarantee built in there, which we think is pretty fantastic. And that's on both personal and business. So if you've got anything that you need legal, go to Google, go to legallyyours.com.au and we can help you. All right, enough about me and Legally Yours. Let's get on to today's session. So we know that startups are often very busy and thinking about intellectual property is not always a priority. It is important to keep in mind that although you can't see it, it doesn't mean it's not there and your IP will need to be properly managed and sufficiently protected. It is one of the greatest investments you can make long term. So protecting it is really essential. And so today, um, Christine and Todd are going to share with you just why you should be paying attention to your IP and what are the fundamentals to consider even though they might not be so obvious. And so some key takeaways for today, understanding the basics of IP, so patterns, trademarks, designs, copyright and trade secrets, understanding IP within your business plan, marketing and contracts, so important, and the difference between business names, domain names and trademarks as well. All right, on to our incredible presenters today. We are so very lucky. So first of all, I'll introduce Tolt with a little wave. So Tolt is a commercial lawyer with experience assisting hundreds of startups and innovative enterprises. Tolt is passionate about ensuring startups are legally structured for success and believes that businesses should look to the future with a proactive and not a reactive attitude. He assists clients to navigate complex transactions, understanding the regulatory framework for the startup industry and solve complex problems. And we are also very lucky to have Christine as well, Christine Bulos with us, who is a commercial and startup lawyer with a passion for business development and innovation. Christine loves engaging with innovative clients who are looking to disrupt market sorry, disrupt in market trends. She frequently assists clients with core business agreements, legal planning, business structuring, and has a strong understanding of the legal and commercial need of founders. Christine and Todd, I'm so excited to have you here presenting this session. So I'm going to mute myself and hand over to you. Thanks so much, Karen. And, and thanks everybody for coming today. Um, and thanks for those great introductions. 
Uh, look, at Ally Legal, we can't recommend Legally Yours enough as a firm that specializes very much in the startup space. We work with founders every day, and we know that you know new businesses resourcing is a factor, and free transparency is something which is really important. So Legally Yours does uh, great work to remove that fee shock, as Karen referred to it, out of the picture and ensure that everybody knows exactly what they're getting into when they engage a legal practitioner. And Silicon Beach, you know, uh, a lot can be said about the work that Silicon Beach does for the startup ecosystem in Australia and a country that, you know, competes with the likes of New York and Austin and London when it comes to the, the startup ecosystem. It's, I think, really important that everybody involved does their part to help grow that ecosystem and, you know, put in place the systems that help it succeed long term. Um, Moving into the presentation and Allied Legal, a bit about us. We are a commercial law firm. We're based in Melbourne, but we have clients all across Australia, pretty much in every state, uh, except currently, I don't believe we have any clients in the Northern Territory. And uh, startups are our main focus. So we're commercial lawyers first. And what that means is any aspect of law that falls into a startup's journey, we have expertise in that domain. Intellectual property is a massive component of that. Every business has intellectual property, but for startups, which are inherently innovative, inherently tech-based, and inherently, um, I guess, idea-focused, that IP consideration is something which needs to be thought about really early on. You know, the, the subheading of this, of this presentation, IP, I can't see it, so why worry about it? It's a fairly abstract concept i think to wrap your head around because unlike your more tangible assets like physical property real property cash which you can you can see you can trade you can deal with ip encompasses a large range of features which all form one coherent asset so we're going to be getting into a lot of those concepts in this presentation uh, we're also going to talk about some of the international considerations when it comes to ip and I think that that aspect of it was promoted in the lead up to this, but the reason we want to touch on it is just because the inherently digital nature of startups and the fact that they have such a massive capacity to scale means that most of our clients fairly early on are looking at overseas markets. So we think that it's important for founders to be considering, you know, the implication of international uh, commerce when it comes to their intellectual property. So if I just flick through, this sort of goes through some of the areas that we uh, focus on at Ally Legal. This isn't exhaustive, but gives a good snapshot. And of course, today we're going to be focusing on IP and international expansion. I will not reintroduce us because I don't think that we could uh, do better than the introductions that Karen gave us, but that's just a lovely photo of, of Christine and I. Um, you can find those same photos on our website. And um, yeah, look, we're, we're really passionate about the space. We both really enjoy working with founders and with startups. Um, everybody that works in the space, I think knows that it's just exciting. It's just an interesting space to be in. I personally have learned so much about so many different industries and so many new technologies by working with uh, folks such as, as yourselves. So with that, I'll pass it over to Christine to give you guys a bit more of an in-depth overview of what we're gonna be covering off in this presentation. Thank you, Tal. Thank you everyone for coming. Really appreciate it. And hopefully you can take some value out of this. Um, so in this workshop, we're going to be talking through the legal framework around IP at both the local and international level, as Tal mentioned. In Australia, the legal framework around IP is the result of hundreds of years of legal development, which has been codified as legislation. This has resulted in a number of protections and challenges for innovators in Australia. So startups should be looking to leverage to the full extent these protections and minimize the challenges as much as possible. It is therefore super important to address your IP early in your startup journey. We often have founders ask us when they have to start protecting their IP. And the answer is always the same. Should be yesterday or otherwise as soon as you can. As soon as you have an idea on paper, you actually have IP in existence and that IP therefore has value. But we'll talk about the sort of protections that are available to you as we move through this presentation. It is good to note that Australia has fairly robust and well-developed laws when it comes to intellectual property protection. There is plenty of research that demonstrates that there is a correlative link between the strength of a country's IP protections and the extent of trade, foreign direct investment, and the technology transfers it enjoys. 
Unsurprisingly, companies that are looking to flip overseas are more attracted to jurisdictions with a sensible IP legal framework. This is because robust IP rights encourage innovation. It provides innovators with a sense of assurance that their work will be protected, that they will retain the ownership and acknowledgement for what they have created, and that they have the ability to raise economic gains from their inventions as well. This is why it's so important to understand the IP framework for the country you're looking to expand into, if that's what you want to do, of course. There is unfortunately a lack of global uniformity when it comes to intellectual property, and I think that's something maybe not a lot of people know about. This means that each country has its own set of IP laws. With that in mind, if you have already taken the steps necessary to protect your IP at home, you will very likely have an easier job of getting this established overseas as well. And so to get into how to protect that IP at home, um, let's start off with some you know, fundamentals of intellectual property. And I think the starting point of wrapping your head around IP is understanding that it is an intangible asset, which means that it can't be physically identified. So luckily I've got this trusty iPhone, um, which we can look at as an example. And the phone itself, what I'm holding, it's a tangible asset. It's probably worth somewhere around, you know, thousand dollars, maybe less because it's an older model. And I own this iPhone. I can sell it. I can do what I want with it. I can smash it with a hammer if I want. Um, and that's, that's mine. That's my physical property. The IP though, that goes into this item and that makes this iPhone is far more complex and far more valuable. You're thinking about the software, the hardware, the system that goes into the phone being assembled and each part that's required to that assembly, the design of the touchscreen, the design of the camera, even down to things like the way that the iPhone alarm clock is designed. I won't go on to every single example of IP that makes up an iPhone because you could easily fill a book describing the various IP that attaches to it, but it is far more complex than the phone itself and worth a heck of a lot more than the thousand odd dollars that the phone itself is worth. So what IP actually is, is a bundle of rights that creates the value in this intangible asset. An owner of IP, or of an IP right, typically receives the right to control the reproduction, preparation of derivative works, distribution of copies, use and application, and public performance and display of that intellectual property. It is these rights that enable the owner of IP to commercialize it, hence creating its bundle. Um, each of these rights are separate and divisible. So this means that the bundle of rights in IP can be licensed, transferred, or assigned, or each separate right can be licensed, transferred, or assigned. Which is why, for example, you can grant someone the right to distribute copies of your IP, maybe through a distribution agreement, without the ability for them to do things like prepare derivative works. If you think about, you know, stores like Telstra or JD Hi-Fi, where you can buy pieces of technology, they have been licensed the right to distribute that certain part of the IP, uh, that distribution rights, but they don't necessarily have the right to reverse engineer an iPhone and make their own version of it. Now. For startups and innovative businesses, IP and the bundle of rights attached to it are far and above a startup's most valuable assets. Unlike a traditional business, you know, if you think maybe something like a restaurant or a retail store in which its most valuable assets might be its stock or its real estate or its commercial contracts, a startup's value generally lies in the commercial potential of its innovative offering. So it's therefore really important that that bundle of rights are protected in full. This isn't always the easiest task though, because the different types of IP attract different types of IP protection. These include things like copyrights, trademarks, patents, trade secrets, and business names. So let's work through all of those. Copyright is a type of intellectual property rights that in Australia attaches to the IP as soon as it is created. It protects a specific form in which an idea is expressed, which is typically referred to as the copy, and it lasts for the life of an author plus 50 or 70 years, depending on the type of copy. It's commonly associated with creative work, such as music or creative writing or arts. So if I, for example, were to write now, sit down and write a, a little poem, that would be copy that I've written, that I have the rights in, and no one else is allowed to reproduce that poem. They're not allowed to sell it or publish it uh, without my permission, subject to some you know, exemptions under copyright law. Even though it's commonly associated with these sort of creative works, it actually attaches to certain commercial works in the same way. For example, source code. Uh, when you're writing software or some sort of application, 
that code is considered a written expression of an idea and copyright attaches to it. So then if you have someone writing code for your platform or your application, whoever's writing it under law automatically owns the copyright for their entire life, plus 70 years beyond that. It's really important that founders appreciate the impact of this because it's very common in the startup landscape for founders to work as you know friends on handshake agreements without any formal agreements in place. One person may come up with the idea, another person may do the marketing, and a third person may actually be writing the code. If all of this happens on the back of a handshake, then at law, the person who writes the code and not the business or company itself owns the copyrights. We're going to discuss later in this presentation, but this is why it's essential to have agreements in place protecting your intellectual property. Now, a trademark is quite different to copyright. A trademark is a type of intellectual protection that specifically protects something which identifies a unique product or brand. The most common examples of trademarks are logos such as the Apple logo or the Coca-Cola fonts. But trademarks can also attach to specific words, shapes, types of packaging, uh, even smells. And unlike copyright, trademarks don't exist automatically. You have to register your trademark in the relevant jurisdiction, which uh, right now would be IP Australia. That's the name of the government body that manages things like trademarks and also patents. Um, so as a start of business, the types of things that you should be thinking about trademarking include your business name and your business logo, and perhaps any catchphrases that go along with those. If you think about McDonald's, they would have a large variety of trademarks and anybody can go onto the IP Australia register and look into those. But some might include obviously the name McDonald's, little catchphrases like I'm loving it, uh, the name of their core products like a Happy Meal, the Golden Arches itself as a visual logo would be trademarked. And um, until those things are trademarked, they don't get statutory protection. A lot of people don't realize this, but when you register a company or even just a business name, that registration doesn't actually grant you exclusive ownership over that name. The purpose of business names and the business name register is actually for consumers to be able to identify the individuals behind the business. But there's nothing in those relevant laws which grant you that exclusive ownership. The only way to get exclusive ownership over a name is by trademarking it. Now, that's not to say that if you have a business name registered and you're trading under that name, that anybody can just go ahead and start, you know, trading with that name because there are some common law, and by common law, I mean law that is developed out of actual cases before courts, which can protect you. But to go down that route, you have to prove a couple of things. You have to prove that you were using the name before they were. You have to prove that their use of the name is causing damage to you by misleading and deceiving the potential consumer base, and that they are actually, the legal term for it is passing off as your brand. Conversely, if you have a trademark registered, you get instant statutory protection and instant statutory relief, which makes it a lot easier to enforce your rights. So trademarking a business name and logo is something which we strongly recommend to startups early on in their journey because it allows them to effectively commercialize a protected name and a protected logo. Uh, a patent is a, again, completely different type of IP protection, which exists for novel inventions and which like trademarks need to be registered through IP Australia. It's a lot harder to get a patent than it is to get a trademark and certainly a lot harder than to get copyright protection. To be eligible for patenting, you need to have created something which is new, useful, and either inventive or innovative. The requirement of being new is often the most difficult threshold to cross, and there are broadly two types of patents. So one is a standard patent, which offers long-term protection and control over a new invention. Uh, this is 20 years or 25 years in the case of pharmaceuticals. A standard patent requires an inventive step, which means that the invention is not an obvious thing to do for someone with knowledge and experience in the technological field of the invention. It has to differ in some way from existing tech, and the difference must be something more than the application of published information or standard knowledge. A good example might be sticking with the iPhone idea, the jump from an iPhone 12 to an iPhone 13. would highly unlikely qualify for a standard patent. But the invention of the first smartphone, that would certainly be patentable. Uh, the other kind of patent is an innovation patent. This is a shorter market life patent that um, might be 
something which is going to be superseded, so like computer-based inventions. It requires an innovative rather than an inventive step. And this is where the invention is different from what is known before. And that difference makes a substantial contribution to the working of the invention, but isn't an entirely new concept altogether. Innovation patents protect incremental advances in technology rather than groundbreaking inventions, and they don't last for as long as your standard patents. The, uh, I guess, issue with patents is that they are long and they are somewhat expensive. Um, the threshold required to hit that new requirement is quite a high threshold to the extent where if there is anything about your invention in the public domain, then it is unlikely to be patentable. There's even been cases of people uh, quite unintentionally shooting themselves in the foot in regards to this. I've heard stories of um, academics who have, you know, published a thesis that refers to some new sort of algorithm. And as a result of publishing that thesis, they are un then unable to go and patent that algorithm or that invention because it's considered to now be in the public domain and is therefore no longer new. We had a client who had um, invented something which they felt was quite novel and quite new. And while that was the case, after mm, only an hour of research, we found that there was a business in China that was proposing to do the same thing and an article had been written about that business. So the invention itself was therefore in the public domain and it was not able to be patented. Now, the other kind of IP that I'm gonna talk about is a trade secret. And this is probably um, the least tangible of all of these intangible rights. A trade secret is any sort of confidential or commercial information of value and typically extends to systems and procedures that enable one's business to compete with or excel beyond another business. A really good pop culture example might be Coca-Cola's recipe or KFC secret blend of herbs and spices. Um, neither the recipe for Coke or the secret blend of herbs and spices for KFC can be trademarked. It's not an invention, so it can't be patented. And um, while the way that the recipe is written might be copyrighted, the recipe itself is not eligible for copyrights. In both cases, both those companies have managed to keep those trade secrets uh, out of the public domain for however many years they've been trading. And the way that they've done that is through putting in place sufficient contracts, which would enable them to basically sue or injunct someone if they tried to take those recipes public. Now, like copyright, you can't register trade secrets with a regulatory body such as IP and trade secrets are protected in two ways. First of all, there are common law protections for trade secrets. If you don't have a contract in place and an employee or a director of the company takes a trade secret to a competitor or the public domain, you can rely on case law to enforce it. Uh, that is always a little bit tricky, though, because case law is inherently fluid. The best way to protect trade secrets is through your commercial contracts. We're going to get into those deeper later on into the presentation, but um, just as I guess a bit of foreshadowing and signposting, one of the clauses that we put in all of our commercial agreements is that all trade secrets have to be maintained with confidentiality. And to the extent that a trade secret is taken public, the company retains the right to sue for damages and um, put in place an injunction. An injunction is effectively a court order telling someone not to do something or to do something. And so you can use this to require a person to, you know, take all available steps to remove that trade secret from whatever domain they shared it in. Um, so hopefully that's given you a good understanding of what IP is and how it can be protected. And I'll pass it over to Christine to talk about some steps you can take to protect your IP locally. Thanks, Paul. So yes, there are several steps you should take to protect your IP locally here in Oz. However, as we explained earlier with the iPhone example, it's not always immediately obvious how much IP actually exists to then be protected. Usually it's more than people anticipate. A good first step is actually identifying your intellectual property and maintaining an IP register. Maybe some of you guys have heard of this. Um, I think we talk about this quite a lot. It's really important that an IP register is created. This will help you understand what needs to be protected. Once you've built your IP register, you will be in a better position to understand what rights already exist and to whom these rights belong. 
you will first want to identify whether there are any risks present to your current IP. If, for example, you have marketing material that was developed by a third party or source code that was written by a different third party, there will likely be some question as to whether who actually owns this IP and to what extent, as touched on earlier. If you have written agreements with those parties, the answer may lie in there. And ideally, the agreement will already assign all their IP rights to your company. If the work was provided by way of an informal unwritten arrangement, then you may be in some hot water. You will also be able to use your IP register to identify what IP is eligible for registration and protection. I'm sure many of you already have unique logos and designs for your brand names and for your brand generally, which would likely be eligible for trademark registration. To register these for trademarks, you will first need to determine what class of trademark your application falls under and ensure that your trademark is not common or prohibited. You'll need to determine what class of goods or services you want to register under and, of course, most importantly, ensure that your trademark is unique enough for registration, which I think is some, something that we sometimes forget, um, you know, as business owners, is it actually unique enough. You can do this by searching the IP Australia trademark registry, which is available online for everyone to access. The whole process from application to registration can take up to several months. So it is important to start sooner rather than later. And sorry, Christine, I'll just cut in there. Um, it will take a minimum of six months for the trademark to be registered. And that's just because that is how long IP Australia needs because they have to comply with certain things around, you know, advertising the trademark, giving anybody in the public the possibility to object. So at a minimum, you're looking at a six month wait time to register a trademark. Yeah, thanks. Tal. And just another reason as why it should be done sooner rather than later, for sure. If you are considering patenting your offering, you'll need to ensure that your idea is novel and inventive enough to be eligible, and if it's actually beneficial to get a patent. Applying for and maintaining a patent does cost time and money, even if the application is unsuccessful. If you have developed a new device, substance, method, or process, you should at least consider whether patenting it will be part of your business strategy. And there's a fair few questions that you should ask yourself. Um, so the potential for commercial returns, whether that outweighs the time, effort, and money required to get and maintain a patent. You should ask yourself the monopoly a patent offers, would that help lessen the risks of intellectual property theft in the markets that you're actually interested in? Whether you have the resources to manage your IP, whether a thorough search reveals no other similar technology and to be sure that you own the invention and have kept it a secret all this time. Similar to the example that Tol gave. We recommend for you to do your research and make sure that you apply for the appropriate form of protection and have the necessary documentation for your patent application. Once you've assessed what IP can be protected, you should then start putting in place key agreements that will protect all of your IP that is not eligible for registration. We'll dive into constructing key commercial arrangements in a bit, so we'll discuss that in greater detail shortly. Finally, but by no means least importantly, a startup should have a company incorporated to house its intellectual property. As we've discussed, many IP rights exist automatically at law and belong to the individual that created the IP. You can put agreements in place so that an incorporated company owns the IP instead of the individual person. This is very beneficial for any business, but especially for startups. This is because it eliminates any question as to the value of the company as it relates to IP. If agreements are in place assigning IP to the company, any stakeholders can be certain that the company actually owns the relevant IP behind its offering which will of course therefore then be very attractive to investors as they'll be confident in the company that they're investing in as well, which therefore prevents disputes down the line if that does happen. <laughs> While many startup founding teams are friends, these relationships can turn sour, unfortunately. Having the IP owned by the company as opposed to the individuals who created it ensures that if there are any disputes down the line, like we mentioned, the ownership of the actual IP will not also fall into that dispute. So a recommendation that we have to deal with that sort of issue is a dual company structure. 
So in this structure, you set up the holding company, which holds the IP and the other assets. And the holding company then owns the trading company, which is the one that goes to market. So in this structure, the trading company takes on all the risk while the assets are all protected in the holding company. And the benefit of having a holding company is that a incorporated entity has a legal personality which is distinct and separate from its shareholders or the individuals or entities that own that company. This isn't a invincible protection. Um, that protection can be breached, but typically when a shareholder is up to no good, if they've acted dishonestly, if they have misled the market or committed fraud or criminal activity, then the um, protection can be breached. So having that dual company structure isn't a, you know, be all and end all solution, but it does provide that one extra layer of protection for your intellectual property by enabling a trading company to take risk while a holding company protects those assets. So once you've taken these steps to protect your intellectual property at home, um, if you're looking at an international expansion or even just an international market, which I'm sure most startups are, you can start thinking about protecting your IP internationally. But once you start looking into overseas jurisdictions, your IP related tasks will become more complex and you may have to repeat much of what we've already discussed in that jurisdiction. If, however, you've taken the necessary steps to protect your IP locally, you'll have a much easier job of doing it overseas. Many of the processes and systems are similar in foreign jurisdictions as they are here, and many of your agreements will be able to be updated or adapted for an overseas stakeholder. So by this stage, your IP should be housed and protected in Australia, whether by registration, commercial agreements, or otherwise. When you expand overseas, it's likely to be by way of a shell company, some sort of corporate vehicle in that jurisdiction, or perhaps even a licensing or commercial arrangement with a representative in that country. An issue to look out for if you're going down this path is to consider whether there are any foreign ownership requirements in the country that you're looking at. Uh, this sort of requirement is one that a company being established or operated in a certain jurisdiction has to be owned or partly owned by a resident of that jurisdiction. So in such circumstances, you may be required to bring on someone in that jurisdiction as a shareholder in your foreign subsidiary. If you're taking that route, you should make sure that it's somebody that you can trust and somebody that you can rely on. Even if those sort of foreign ownership requirements don't apply, you are still now operating with an entity under a new jurisdiction. Now, at this stage, all of your IP should be protected in Australia, and there may not be an immediate need to start leveraging and, uh, all of your IP overseas. In the initial phase, the only IP you may need overseas is likely to be your trademarks and business names. Unfortunately, as you mentioned at the outset, the laws around IP are not globally uniform. So the first thing you wanna do is map out the legal framework for IP in that relevant jurisdiction. As part of doing this, you should find out if the country that you're looking to expand into is a party to any international treaty such as the Berne Convention or the Madrid Protocol. The Berne Convention provides protection in relation to copyrights and the Madrid Protocol provides protection in relation to trademarks. And in any case, you should figure out whether such treaties apply or not, and then map out what steps you need to take to protect your trademarks, business name, and other IP in that jurisdiction. It's really critical at this stage that you use a local lawyer with the knowledge of the local legal system as part of this process. Not only will a local practitioner be able to help you map out the applicable legal framework, framework but you'll also have someone on the ground if anything does go wrong. It's worth noting that if you do engage someone in the foreign jurisdiction, it's really good practice to consolidate your international legal efforts under your Australian lawyer. This is especially the case if you're looking at multiple jurisdictions. A trusted Australian lawyer will help you manage your requirements and interests throughout this process and will be able to engage with the foreign lawyer in a effective and efficient measure. Now, once you've mapped out the legal framework in the country that you want to expand into, start taking steps to protect your IP, uh, such as registering your trademarks and business names. To start with, see if that trademark is available overseas. This may involve researching the IP records of the country of interest and checking whether there may be any potential infringement issues. For example, you can use the World Intellectual Property Organization, uh, also known as WIPO. They have a trademark search function to see if their trademark exists in other jurisdictions. Otherwise, you may have to utilize the relevant databases for that jurisdiction. 
Not only will this tell you if your IP is eligible for registration overseas, but it will also prevent you from unintentionally infringing on someone else's IP. I heard a horror story years and years and years ago where some very small country in, sorry, very small business in an Eastern European country, their last name was McDonald's and they opened up a restaurant called McDonald's. And I think you can figure out where it went from there. Where possible, you should register your trademark and business name in the jurisdiction that you would like to break into, as this is a great first step to setting up and protecting your foreign subsidiary. You'll then need to determine what the overseas company's role and function will be. In the early stages, this will likely be for marketing and distribution to help you build a market overseas. It should therefore be made clear by way of a written agreement between the Australian company and the overseas company what the extent and limits of the overseas company's role is. It should be made clear that the foreign entity does not own and is not assigned any of the local company's IP, therefore assuring that your IP in Australia remains owned and protected within Australia. I'll note as an aside that if you want investors from overseas jurisdictions, they may not be investing in the Australian company and may want to invest in the foreign company. In that instance, they may require that the foreign company does have a stake in your IP. That is a different conversation that goes beyond the scope of this workshop, but it is just something which I would like you all to bear in mind if you are looking at expanding. To the extent that you have a SaaS or a physical product that you're marketing overseas, the ownership of that IP should be retained by the Australian company, and then the product would be offered through your terms and conditions or customers agreements, which should be governed by Australian law. Having said that, as you will want to be marketing those products overseas, there should be a clear agreement with the Australian company and the foreign subsidiary, which makes it clear that the foreign subsidiary only has the rights to market and distribute that product in a specific jurisdiction and that no ownership is assigned. This is especially the case if you have to comply with a foreign ownership requirements because you don't want, or you might not want a, um, a foreign owner of your company to necessarily have an ownership stake in your very valuable IP. Each of these agreements should include clear, clear limitations around territory, timing, and the extent of the IP being licensed, by which I mean which of those bundle of rights is being licensed, so that there is no ambiguity in the parameters of the relationship. There may also be a commercial need to start engaging with third parties overseas in addition to your subsidiary or foreign company. And this may especially be the case if your business involves a physical product because you may need manufacturers, distributors, or marketers overseas. For example, even if you're not looking at expanding overseas, it might be cheaper for you to manufacture in a different country. Or if your startup offering is software-based to do some of the maintenance and servicing of the software overseas. While the IP in the product or in the service is all housed and owned in Australia, it's still really critical that your agreements with the international third parties clearly sets out the limitations around that IP that's being shared. Further, in such cases, you should consider diversifying your commercial network in the overseas country. Relying on local manufacturers or other local business partners can put trade secrets at risk, and even if the country has a sensible legal regime around IP, taking legal action will often be costly and time consuming. A good practice can be, if possible and if you have the resourcing, to divide protection among several foreign manufacturers so that no single entity has all of the company's secrets and the final assembly remains under your sole control. Um, to the extent that you're bringing on international stakeholders, whether these are third party service, service providers or investors, make sure you conduct your due diligence into those parties. You should check to see if they have any recorded IP violations, uh, if they have a reputation as being trustworthy in their fields, and if they have a history of dealing with other Australian businesses. A competent lawyer in that foreign jurisdiction should be able to assist you with some of these tasks. Now, Finally, before forming, formally transacting with any overseas entity or stakeholder, you should make sure that you have agreements prepared and ready to be implemented as appropriate. And I'll let Christine talk you through some of those agreements. Thanks, Tol. So as a good start, every person who has contributed IP to your startup should sign something called a deed of IP assignment. This is something I recommend all of you guys to remember. Deed of IP assignment is very important. It's a simple document. It just assigns and transfers to the company all proprietary rights in any IP relating to your startup, which could include things like marketing material, sales material, pitch decks, and of course, more obvious things like source code. If you already have agreements in place with those certain stakeholders, you should review those agreements to determine the status of the IP rights. 
What we are seeing more and more of is third-party contractors, such as developers, distributors, manufacturers, including provisions that let them retain an unreasonable amount of IP rights in what they are developing. Even if that's not the case, it may be that the third party has, with all good intentions, not sufficiently accounted for the treatment of IP in their contracts. And if upon review, the contracts are indeed insufficient, you should consult a lawyer immediately to determine the extent of the risk and what recourse you have available. Hopefully, it will be as simple as having the third party sign the deed of IP assignment. You should also ensure that you have agreements prepared for any other stakeholders that thoroughly protects your IP. These may include licensing agreements relating to the use of IP internationally, agreements with your manufacturers or suppliers, marketing teams, employees, contractors and clients. Anyone really that will or may come into contact with your IP should be party to an agreement which protects the ownership of your IP. You may be thinking that an agreement relating to, for example, a manufacturer only needs to cover off on your manufacturing requirements, but you should really have agreements in place that make it very clear what the regime is around IP. So there's five things that I would suggest these types of agreements should set out at a minimum. So one, that all proprietary and ownership rights in the IP is to be retained by the company. Two, the extent to which the other party can utilize or access the IP. Three, any territorial or time limitations around their use of the IP. Four, clear definitions of what constitutes IP. And finally, the remedies available to you if they breach their IP requirements. So these are all clauses that can be and should be included in any sorts of agreements. These requirements need to be set out and it needs to be very clear that the counterparty's use of the IP does not go beyond the specific scope and nature of the transaction at hand. Even if your IP is protected automatically at law, clearly written agreements will make it much easier for you to enforce your rights. When you are looking overseas, it is also important to have a licensing agreement with your foreign subsidiary. Even though the companies will be connected by way of ownership, it is still important to have this agreement in place. Not only will this prevent and mitigate the sort of risks and threats to the ownership of your IP that we've discussed, but there may also be international transfer of tax issues. So this is somewhat out of the scope. I think we touched on this a little earlier, but for completeness, there can sometimes be international tax imposed where there is a movement of value from one country to another. Unfortunately, we can't escape tax. I think that's tax and death are probably <laughs> some of the few certain things in life. I'm sure we all resonate with that. This can be avoided or limited by way of well-written contracts though. So there is an exception. Also, if there is a foreign ownership requirement in the relevant country, it will need to be made clear that the foreign owner is not granted any rights in your IP, unless, of course, that's the intention. When it comes to engaging with your clients, depending on your business model, you may do this by standard terms and conditions or by way of tailored agreements. Either way, it should be made clear what limitations your customers have in relation to your IP. Generally, these agreements would expressly forbid them from copying, mimicking, or passing off the legal term that we spoke about um, in relation to the IP and make it clear that the company does retain all ownership. If you were to read any standard terms and conditions that you have probably already agreed to, like Apple or Netflix, they would contain these provisions as well. And yeah. just to close off on those commercial agreements, um, the, uh, I guess, internal agreements as well. Um, are you know key to protecting your intellectual property so in the case of employees uh generally copyright that is created by an employee is immediately immediately assigned to the employer but that doesn't apply to contractors and it doesn't necessarily apply to directors or co-founders so things like your shareholders agreements will often be a good place to have an ip assignment clause um and you know the first thing that christine mentioned was a deed assigning ip that's basically a short form agreement that just deals with the IP assignment. But in the case that you have other agreements already in place or that you're gonna put other agreements in place, the content of the deed assigning IP can sort of be um, absorbed and dealt with within the context of a broader agreement. Um, as a general rule, as a startup, anytime that you are engaging with any entity or individual at a commercial level, IP should be dealt with. So look, 
with that, hopefully that has given you a good understanding of protecting your IP locally and overseas and identifying and understanding IP. We'll pass it over to you guys to ask any Q&A. Um, feel free to drop questions in the chat or if you'd like to, you can just unmute and ask. I believe that there is already been one question from, um, let me just <laughs> we'll open it up, which has to do with Provision provisional like patent applications. Yeah. I'm just trying to find the chat feature. Here we go. Cool. So yeah, we didn't really touch on provisional patents, so it's a fair question. Um, and you're quite right. It does give you about a 12 month period, basically flagging your intention to apply for a patent down the line. Um, this can be a good step if, you know, as we mentioned, it's good to consider whether patenting is worth it during the early part of your business processes and a provisional application can be a step that you can take. I should note that a provisional patent application doesn't provide you with patent protection. Um, now, and I should flag as well that patenting is one of the few areas of IP that we don't deal with at a commercial level. We generally refer it on to a patenting specialist because it is a highly specialized field. We'll provide general advice on patenting advice uh, options that are available. Um, so I won't go into too much detail on provisional applications, but I do just want to flag that it doesn't give you the same protections that an actual patent does. But that being said, definitely something to consider as part of your uh, legal planning for your business. No, I agree. And, and I think on that, having a patent specialist, um, we've certainly got those within our legal yours community. It's really important. And even in terms of looking for a patent specialist that has that particular area of expertise, so whether it's medical or technology or scientific, that's really important too, because um, you just don't want to waste money. They can be very, very expensive. You want to make sure that it's doing right in that first instance. Um, while we're just giving a moment for everybody, if they've got any questions or they want to just, just flag down and we can certainly answer those questions. I just wanted to thank you both. Um, so much information in there and it was so valuable, things that we've never really talked about before. So I've ran a couple of these different sessions and I've never had anyone actually talk about trade secrets. So I think that's just incredibly important. And also, you know, that deed of assignment and, and setting up that company structure to hold the IP. I think we do sometimes forget that there's ways that we can do that to really minimise um, the risk that we have. We're getting lots of thank yous um, in that in the chat as well um well look what we might do is we might end the recording and then we can allow people to come online and and ask questions so on behalf of legally yours and obviously silicon beach as well thank you so much christine and holt we will have this recording available um and so and the slides too i believe i think christine answered there was a question whether the slides would be available so we will send all that through to silicon beach um and there'll be a way to access that from there um but thank you so much and don't forget to go onto silicon beach and check out all of the other upcoming events that they have across the month so much great stuff for all of us startup founders and of course if you need a lawyer um, obviously reach out for told and christine at allied legal uh, if you're looking for ip protection or startup um, stuff for your um, business but also if you need a personal lawyer for wills estates family property all those other things as well head to legally yours give us a try come on we'll match you and you'll be <laughs> able to get that lovely legal services without the bill shock all right thank you so much team thanks christine and told thank you